Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Jacksonville Zoom at noon meeting. I will now, now call the meeting to order by ringing of the Rotary Bell. Thank you for joining us. During the program, everyone will be on mute, so feel free to submit questions by utilizing the chat function. I also want to remind you that today's presentation is being recorded. Marie Nagy will provide today's indication. Marie? Thank you, President Jerry. On October 13th of this year, world peace was prayed for across our region, state, country, around the globe. I hope that prayer for peace continues today. Today, November 2nd, pray with me for peace as the viruses of pandemic proportion, COVID-19 and racism challenge peace, and elections and election day loom large in our consciousness. Pray with me that we can all say, dear Lord, we are ambassadors for peace in our world. Peace in the world begins with peace in our hearts. We express this peace when we connect with the power of divine love within each of us. Centered in love, let us create an environment of kindness, empathy, and respect that spreads outward. Let this ripple effect motivate others to think and act from a place of kindness within themselves. Help us to begin with a smile, recalling times when we were touched by the simple smile of another. Let us speak with respect, knowing that all people have viewpoints based on prior experience. Let us try to see the world through their eyes. To the Most High, who is able to keep us from falling, we set our intentions to speak only words of peace. We visualize the citizens of our United States at peace. Amen. Thank you, Marie. Our annual bell ringing for the Salvation Army will take place two days this year, Tuesday, December 1st and Thursday, December 3rd. We need volunteers to sign up the ring from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. on both days. This year, we will participate in a friendly competition with Mennonac by taking calls for the Salvation Army during their phone tell their phone-a-thon on Thursday, December 3rd from 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. We will be in the press box at the East Club at the stadium. We need 10 volunteers. Sign up for both of these events are through Sign Up Genius. The link is in your weekly spokesman and on this website. Last week, Pete Hicks, our hands-on committee chairman, shared the details about our food drive. Many of you responded with a donation and we are grateful and certainly able to take your contributions on behalf of the club. However, we need volunteers to help. We need an essential item to prepare a Thanksgiving meal. If you plan to join us at the Omni on November 16th, you can bring them with you. We have also arranged a central point for members to drive through and deliver items at the Youth Crisis Center on Saturday, November 21st from 9 a.m. until 12 noon. You will not have to get out of your vehicle. If you're unable to make Saturday, we can arrange for pickup where you wish, so please reach out to a committee member in advance. This is another time for our great club to shine in our community, so make plans to volunteer. November is Foundation Month. Quarterly statements were emailed last Friday. Now is the time to review and assess your foundation giving. If you have questions about giving, please contact our foundation chair, Nancy Bernard. Some of you are only a few dollars away from your next Paul Hella Harris milestone. Some of you may want to consider the foundation your will or estate plan. Please note on your calendar, we will not meet next Monday on the 9th. The following Monday on November 16th, we will host live our first face-to-face -face meeting since March. This will be a hybrid meeting. Some of us have met with the Omni. We have social distancing protocols in place and we will offer a hybrid program via Zoom for those who are unable to attend. It is extremely important that everyone follow these guidelines. Attendees must register online for noon, by noon, Thursday, November 12th, for the Omni. Attendees will be given three plate options. 
you must select your meal choice during registration. During the program, except for the period you are eating, you will have to wear a mask. Uh, upon arrival, we will have temperature checks and a waiver for each attendee to sign. If you are sick or feel sick, please stay home. Our virtual format will still be available for those who are unable to attend, but you must register separately for the Zoom at noon meeting to receive login credentials. We have few volunteers helping with Zoom during this program, so all attendees have to be identified, enter a waiting room, then be admitted into the meeting. The time of our meeting will go back and remain on our old format starting on the 16th. 12 noon check-in, will be served, we will be served a plated meal. This will be a great time for Zoom attendees to network among themselves. I will ring the bell at 12.30 to begin the meeting. We will adjourn at 1.30 p.m. We will not meet the week of Thanksgiving. We will return to Zoom at noon only on November 30th. Monday, November 30th, then live again on December 7th. Please visit our website and read your email for detailed instructions. Past president Tracy Jenks will introduce today's speaker. Tracy served as club president from 2018 to 2019. She started her career in real estate in 1992. She's a senior director and commercial office broker at Cushman & Wakefield. Tracy is a graduate of the University of Georgia. She resides in Ortega. She's been recognized for many community awards and is very active in our community. Tracy also serves as vice chair of the board for Downtown Vision. Tracy will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, President Jerry. Um, I am so happy to be able to introduce my good friend, Jake Gordon, today. Uh, many of you probably all, you know, a lot of us know Jake. He's so involved in the community and um, we just love Jake. Um, he is the CEO of Downtown Vision for the last five years. It's hard to believe it's been five years. Um, if you're not familiar with DVI, it's our business improvement district for downtown. Um, he's done a phenomenal job um, with helping our downtown. Um, he received his law degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his undergrad from the University of California in San Diego. He is a member of ULI, very involved in ULI. He's on the board of the Jack's Chamber and on the board of the International Downtown Association. Um, in 2018, he was named by the JBJ as one of North Florida's ultimate CEOs. Um, he lives in San Marco with his wife, Dana, who is um, a saint in my book for dealing with living with Jake, but um, she's a, a she's an awesome person too. She's a really good golfer, and um, they have two kids and um, live in San Marco. So, without further ado, Jake Gordon. Thank you, Tracy. I really appreciate it. My wife is a saint, and she really appreciates you saying <laughs> that. She has to deal with me, and now all of you guys have to deal with me for just a little bit. I have been to many a Rotary meeting here in downtown. And I've always been jealous of the speakers up there. And now I get to yell at my computer because that's 2020 for you. So I hope we can all get back to real life uh, very soon. Uh, hope you can hear me. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Thumbs up if you can hear me, everyone. Thumbs up, anybody? Can anybody? Hear me? Okay, great. I see this guy, thumbs up, good. Um, so really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I will be talking about downtown. Hopefully you see some pictures of a skyline that I'm sharing my screen and that's going well. And so I have whipped through a bunch of slides to talk about downtown, how great downtown's going, and even in, uh, even in a virus pandemic. And then I'll take a bunch of questions. Hopefully there'll be questions. So thanks again, Tracy, who's on our board and a great board member for Downtown Vision. And uh, uh, we love you helping our organization and helping downtown. I see a lot of other people that I know on here that are obviously helping downtown. Liz McCoy, James Weldon Johnson. She just smiled when I said that. Uh, John Avedano, who's at FSCJ. There's a bunch of other people. Mike Biagini, who's great. You guys are all great. Really appreciate you all supporting downtown. And hopefully I can convert some more of you. So really quickly, Tracy mentioned a business improvement district. That's a legal term of art. She mentioned I went to law school. So lawyers ruin everything. I know that. So I like to get into the technical details. Um, we have an assessed district that's in downtown Jacksonville. And it's very similar to a lot of other places around the country. And she mentioned the International Downtown Association. That's kind of like the association of those bids. We call them business improvement district. And all that means is it's a legal term of art that 
in a certain area, you draw a line and say everyone in this area pays a certain amount to a nonprofit to help uh, make that area better. So similar to kind of a property association, or you know, you're all you're all kicking in your HOA fees, and then they're doing the events, they're helping clean up, they're managing the pool or whatever else you have in your neighborhood. We are that for downtown. We're really kind of a neighborhood association and get our money assessed so we don't have to go ask for it. Um, we are not all of downtown though. We are only this half square mile district and what we would consider the central core of downtown. People ask all the time, are we in the South Bank? We are in the South Bank, but we end at Prudential. And so it's really just kind of the center of the center of downtown. Almost everything that we do, we do for all of downtown, which you see this DIA logo, I'll talk about them in a second, but obviously Lori Boyer and her team at the Downtown Investment Authority represent this whole area. So when we say downtown, we always mean the whole area, um, but technically our property owners, our, our members of the downtown vision are only in this orange area. Oh, too far. So people always ask me, if only we had a plan for downtown, there's definitely a plan for downtown. Uh, we as a city did that back during Mayor Brown's administration when my board was instrumental a little bit and others were in trying to make sure we had an agency focusing just on downtown. As many of you know, being in Jacksonville for much longer than five years, uh, our city is gigantically massive. And I've been here five years and still really have no idea where people are sending me when they tell me to go somewhere out of downtown. Luckily, I only have to be in downtown most of the time, but I think it's like 860 square miles. And we have an agency that's focused just on three square miles. So I mentioned just these square miles, and that's been really, really helpful as a city for us to create that. Andre Wallace, the original CEO of the DIA, and now Lori Boyer, former city council president. We have a 365 page plan. It's available at their website. You can go to DIA's website, which is brand new. We helped them with that a little bit. And it has the CRA plan with a, it's called a bid plan, also confusing but they have about a 350 page plan that talks about everything they're trying to do as an agency in downtown. The big difference with them is that, um, you know, they're the investment authority, right? So it's the downtown investment authority. They are investing the city's money. So all the time I mess up DVI and DVA in terms of how uh, DVI and DIA, I mess up the acronyms all the time. So don't feel bad if you have no idea what's going on, but the DIA is the city. Lori works at the city. She works, kind of at the players and uh, the pleasure of the mayor, but also for her board of directors, but she is a city employee. I am not a city employee. I run a nonprofit, but it gets very close together because the city is our biggest contributor here in downtown. So we work very, very closely with the city. A lot of people probably think I'm a city employee. I'm not, I don't have those benefits. I have to manage my own nonprofit, but you can see how we like to think of ourselves as a public private partnership for downtown. So, so really the DIA is really investing on behalf of the city and they're also really running the show in that, that every city in America, when you're thinking about the downtown, the downtowns are run by the city, right? The city decides what should be in the city. If it's a downtown, most of downtown is public, uh, you know, public streets, public areas, parks, spaces, those are all responsible for the city. So the mayor is still the most important person in downtown. We like to think that our board of directors and our downtown property owners, though, have a seat at the table. And the mayor and Lori and the DIA board have been very, very, um, we're very, very thankful they've been working with us to make sure we're kind of part of that conversation. And as you can see, there's a lot of things going on in downtown, which I'll talk about. Uh, our board, for better or for worse, smartly, I think, thanks to them, says we need to be tightly aligned with the DIA. But if you go around the country, there's a lot of other organizations that are not aligned with their city. We think we need to be aligned with our city, so that's how we operate. Oh. So now what I want to talk about was our state of downtown. I put it in the chat. You can go to dtjacksreports.com or downtownjacksonville.org slash research to download this report. It's a fantastic report, beautiful. Uh, our vice president of marketing, Kat Hardwick, does the whole thing in house. She's incredible. Um, you can see the cover of it. I think it looks beautiful, but I'll just show you some slides right now. One of our jobs is to really uh, recap how well downtown is doing. This is not something the Downtown Investment Authority would do, right? They're investing our money. They're thinking about the next project, like Lot J, like the landing site, like Fort on Bay. We're trying to collect all the data that's available for downtown and kind of tell a story on behalf of the property owners and also uh, all of the stakeholders. So the short answer of downtown is that we were doing really, really, really well until a global virus pandemic happened, which all of you guys are aware of. That's why we're on Zoom and not hanging out at a downtown hotel right now. So most of this report 
is from January to June 2020, but there still is a fair amount of data, about three months of data that's post-pandemic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through most of what was happening because this is an 18-month snapshot, and then I'll get to the end where obviously there's a lot of questions about COVID and we have some, maybe some discussion and answers. Obviously, no one knows when this pandemic will end. No one knows what the future really holds. The, the, the main takeaway from this, uh, we've been doing this since, um, we've been collecting data on downtown since we were created in 2000. And so last year was the best year downtown's ever had. Even to previous, we had 2000 to 2005 were like a gravy train with biscuit wheels also. Like we were going way up, it was going great. And then if you remember, the economy fell out in 2007, 2008. And then when I got here in 2015, we were basically barely coming out of that. Everything stopped. Construction stopped. No one had money. We didn't really build anything in downtown of consequence for a decade. It was a real hard time for the entire state of Florida. You know, a lot of people uh, getting their homes foreclosed on. And so obviously that was an incredibly difficult crisis that we took a while to climb out of. We don't think this crisis is the same as that. People are trying to compare those. But the reality is this is better than even pre-2007. We had about $530 million of completed projects in this 18 month period, $3 billion under construction and $3 billion proposed. So even if you wanna throw out the shipyards and uh, you know, the bigger projects, the district, which are still happening in my opinion, those are the last 3 billion on the right here. That still means that $3 billion of construction is happening right now. To put that in perspective, that's more dollars invested in construction than we had from 2000 to 2017. So for the first 17 years that we were thinking about this, this is more under construction right now, cranes are around, than we had the entire rest of the time. So what I've been using the word hockey stick style graph, it like goes like this and then it goes straight up. We have a huge amount of investment right now. And obviously it takes a long time to reap the benefit of that investment, but you'll see it. 530 million of completed projects. Some people are really conservative. They're like, don't tell me anything except what was already finished. And I go, okay, even if you take that number, that number last year, 2018 to 2019, was 210 million. So the projects that were finished, 152% more money was invested than we invested the last year. So if you take anything in this report, take that we were doing really, really, really well. We disinvested in our downtown for a long time, but we're finally putting our money where our mouth is and showing how a lot of things are happening. One of the things that we've really been focusing on is residents. Every uh, neighborhood is only as good as its residents. Um, you know, you guys have a great organization that is run by a lot of volunteers. You know how much work that takes. Downtown historically does not have that many people working for it because usually any neighborhood is going to be the people that live there. The people that work there might help a little bit, but really like if your neighborhood has people that work there, who's really helping your neighborhood? It's really the people that live there. And so historically we've always had a huge inequity between the people that work in downtown and the people that live there. We have about 56,000 people that work in downtown and only about 5,000 to 6,000 now people that live there. The good news is we have, now we do have 6,000. When I got here five years ago, we had about 4,000 people living in downtown. Even just last year, we're up 18%, which means, you know, the development is happening. Residents are happening. There's a bunch of residential that's going on. Um, we have a new website that you can go to, livedowntownjacksonville.com, which we partner with the chamber. Daniel Davis and his team does a great job trying to lower the bar in terms of figuring out where you can live downtown. I was thinking this one was next. This is all the new units that are being built. And so again, you know, back in 15, they were just building like 220 Riverside, if you guys remember. And that was the first project that's over there in the Brooklyn area where Unity Plaza is. That was the first project that had happened residential in downtown in like a decade plus, basically. And now we have all of these projects and they're building even more. So over a five year period, really, really doing well. Uh, on the previous slide, it said downtown has a pretty high capacity rate, 94% occupancy. So the lesson there is if you build it in downtown, like the Barnett building, which recently opened, it will fill up. And obviously it's all about the price point you get if you're a developer, but there is a demand to live downtown. Or even a couple years ago, we didn't really know because there wasn't as much inventory to really know. But really all of this stuff that's been built has been taken up. You can see all these sales figures and I won't bore you with all those, but take a look at the report. Um, the reality is a huge amount of people that live in downtown like living in downtown, we could always do a better job. I think loitering transient population, this is the number one thing we get told all the time. We are saying, like the mayor's saying and everyone's saying, hey, live downtown, 
but we also have about 25% of the, of the transient population of like three counties in one three square mile area. And there's a million reasons for that. I'm actually just getting on the continuum of care board. There's a lot of other changing homelessness and all the social services. Right now, I will tell you during COVID is the worst time for transients in downtown because CDC guidelines will say we can't move them, we can't touch them. And also the, the homeless shelters are all socially distant. So maybe it's just me. I dwell on the worst things about downtown because we're trying to fix it. The good things about downtown are that the people that live there love the city live in. They love the entertainment and events. Obviously, it's a hyper walkable neighborhood. Most of Jacksonville is not that walkable, but the most walkable neighborhoods are urban core and downtown is very walkable. So um, we encourage you to go to Live TT Jax and live downtown. Uh, we have even more residents than ever before, and we need more to really make it even better. The office market is still strong, even with COVID. I'll mention at the end, but this is a lot of this data is from pre-COVID, but you know, you pay a premium to be in an office space in downtown. Tracy, as an expert real estate broker, will tell you that. And so historically, we didn't really have the ability, you know, there was always a question, was it better to be on South Side? Was it better to be in some other areas? And in the last five years, at least for me, we've been able to raise that up, meaning people do want to pay more of a premium to be in downtown because they get a lot more. Obviously, parking is a challenge. That's always going to be a challenge. That's similar to all the places around the country. But what isn't true is that if you're in downtown Seattle, you pay a huge premium to be in an office building because that's a premier address in downtown Seattle. And you also can walk to the market and walk to things that are around. We have more work to do on the amenities that you can walk to. But even with what we have, we're doing a great job. And you see the class A office space is fantastic and the vacancy is relatively low. When you get to class C is when that kind of drags down our, and that's really goes to the quality of who we're trying to pitch to. So uh, I mentioned the occupancy rate. Uh, this is actually the vacancy rate. So you see back in 2011, we were at almost 25% vacancy, which is kind of catastrophic for a downtown. Um, and, then, and then this is the suburbs, right? So they were at less than 20%. So this, this giant inequity where the, the market in the suburbs was really, really well done. And then, uh, and then um, you know, we had a huge amount of vacancy in downtown. We did use CBRE for this. Sorry, Tracy, we use Cushman a lot also. And so if you get Tracy Jenks's uh, newsletter, which you definitely should, we use her stuff on the report. So sorry if that just says this. Um, but you can see if you go to the end of this graph, in 2017, we actually had a lesser vacancy rate than the suburbs, which was huge for us. And now we're back down. We went up a little and then we went back down. And now the suburbs have way higher vacancy rates. So that could also be that the suburbs are building more offices, which is probably true. But also, uh, this is huge for us being at 14.6%. As you get to closer to 10%, that's going to be really where you're a very, very healthy downtown. If you go to like a place in Atlanta, like Center District, or Atlanta almost has multiple downtowns. If you, you get to 10%, that's really, really doing well. 25% is like catastrophic. So sometimes hard to put these in perspectives. I always try to say like baseball, if you hit five out of 10, you're the greatest player that's ever lived. If you hit three out of 10, you're still really good. If you hit two out of 10, you're actually terrible and you don't even make the major. So these numbers are somehow hard to parse, but that's where 25% is catastrophic. 14% is getting way closer to being much, much better. This is a huge, uh, and now I think Tracy's the one that told me we're down to even 14.2% 14, 14 in quarter one. So even as we were trending right up into COVID, we were going even further down. Obviously fantastic to hear now we're uh, in, a, in more of uncertainty, but still doing well. So you can see that downtown office rates are still a premium. They always are. They kind of have to be. You have to pay for an elevator. You have to pay for a lot of things in a giant skyscraper. One of the things that's a challenge for us in COVID is the elevators because people had a hard time getting into their building. Um, but you can see that downtown has always been a premier um, place to be compared to the suburbs in terms of office lease rates. Uh, we do have two huge projects that are still happening. If you come to downtown, you're, even if you come to downtown every day, you may not see these projects unless you're right near them. And the reality is JEA, through all their trials and tribulations, still moving forward with their new world headquarters, which is a huge office right here. My office is actually right here in Ed Ball. And people that work in Ed Ball still go, oh my God, they're building that? All of this, this huge area right by the courthouse, right in between the courthouse and Ed Ball on Adams Street, it's under construction. The Ryan companies, which done a bunch of work, it's going to be kind of a turnkey landlord where JEA will rent from one landlord, which is the way we see these real estate projects going 
as a public-private partnership. They're building this beautiful new headquarters here in downtown Jacksonville. Even more exciting is FIS. They are doing a $150 million project. They are a billion dollar company. Um, Tracy mentioned ultimate CEOs of Jacksonville or not. And I was, I was one of those, which is exciting. And it was great for me to be up there with Gary Norcross who runs a $10 billion FIS and I run a $1 million uh, tiny nonprofit, but that's exciting. That's more Jacksonville than anything. But FIS could go anywhere in the whole world, right? They are a billion dollar company, huge money. They doubled down on downtown Jacksonville. They did not have to do that. They didn't do it for us, honestly. They did it for all of the reasons that were very self-interested to them. But the fact is the governor's office and Jacks USA and Andre and Jerry Malott before him and Daniel Davis and the, the mayor and the mayor's office, we all were really working hard. When I got here five years ago, FIS had already started their process of maybe looking to expand because they were growing so rapidly. And so the fact that they doubled down on downtown Jacksonville in the Brooklyn area, you just cannot underestimate what a huge deal that is. It totally gets lost because we have all these projects, but the reality is that that's a huge, huge, huge project. So many jobs. And then if you know, if you know this project well, Florida Blue had to like trade parking lots with them. The DIA had to move some land around. It really shows that Jacksonville is a really close-knit community that will really get it done. And we're very, very open to development in downtown. And we have the people that work really hard to make sure that this will happen. So I won't talk more about that, but please, please feel free to ask me more about that. Retail is the number one thing people always want in downtown. Even though it seems like we're still light on retail, we actually have been consistently adding retail for the last five years. Downtown's huge. We have three square miles, but we do add uh, retail all the time. Um, even right now, we have a Chipotle right near our burrito gallery in Brooklyn. We have Jumpin' Jacks, which is right there in the FSCJ building on uh, Adam Street, which we love. So tons of stuff going on. It's just about, you know, every 10 years for a city is really like one year. And so it takes a long, long time to build up a density. So uh, give us a little benefit of the doubt. Uh, we mentioned the DIA. Lori Boyer is doing a fantastic job there. Her job is to invest the city's money and to invest it wisely. She just created a new program that's an exi the existing retail enhancement program has been kickstarted and it's called the Fab Rep Food and Beverage Retail Enhancement Program. Five year forgivable loans. If you look at the number at the bottom, Bread and Board is going into Vistar. Vistar, an amazing partner in downtown, bought a skyscraper. They are moving like 1,200 people to downtown, which cannot be understated. Brian Wolfberg and his team, incredible. Bread and Board is going to be a signature Bread and Board space. They got $375,000 from the city. That sounds like a lot until you realize that that's the, the fit out of this space is like $1.1 million, right? So it's like, this space is gonna be unbelievable. It's gonna have a little market. It's gonna have a little grab and go. It's gonna open up to the street. And that's where if, if people wanna invest 1.1 million in a retail space, which doesn't happen often, the city wants to be an investor and catalyze that investment. So if you look at Calford Chop House, that's another example of what was under the old plan we, the city heavily invested in that um, place to make it a great amenity. Excuse me. This program is not everywhere. It's only certain areas on the North Bank, and you can see those areas. And there's about $3 million a year mark for that, so it's a great program. All right. I'm getting myself too excited. I'm going to just take a breath for a second. Hopefully, you guys are doing well and understanding, and I'm going to pass out from excitement. There is so much to say about public transit in downtown. I have this one slide. Just know that Nat Ford and his team at JTA are doing a fantastic job. Groundwork Jacksonville, KE Haas doing the Emerald Trail. The DIA changing streets to two-way. We could, I could give you like a four-hour nonstop lecture on just transportation in downtown. FDOT taking down the ramp by the old landing site. There is so much happening in this space. Just in the middle of COVID, the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center, effectively our Grand Central Station for all of North Florida, just opened up in the La Villa neighborhood. It's right here where this little bus thing is. If you go over there, it's brand new. It's opening. If you use transit, it's unbelievable. Go Tuckin is on here. Steph Dale, I see her. She's partnering with JTA. So much transportation happening in downtown. So much to say. We want everyone to come to downtown and no one to use a car. Basically, that's the future. Um, but don't have as much, obviously I always put the city on here because they're one of the people that, uh, you know, everything revolves around the city. Every public street is the city. Every one of these agencies has to work with the city. So 
so much to say there. Look at the report. There's so much more to talk about, but transportation is transforming into downtown and you will not need a car to get around. And I will mention everything's available at tcjacks.com. It works really good on your phone. We just redid our entire website, spent a bunch of money on it. Please use it. Tweet me or text me or Snapchat me or TikTok me if it doesn't work for you and we'll figure it out. DIA is doing another great program, which I got a little annoyed at the media for being like, it passed with little fanfare. Because that's the media's job is to make everything a big deal, but they don't like it when no one's against something. So this project was so good that no one was against it. It's a big change, but they basically, you know, I can't even compliment with little fanfare. With little fanfare, I mean, it came up to council and every all council voted on it unanimously. And we changed the old historic preservation program, which had a $1 million cap. Now the DPRP, a lot of acronyms. We know that, we know there's too many. The DPRP is so now it's a sliding scale if you want to fix up historic buildings in downtown, you are going to be able to get money from the city. And there are a lot of people that want to fix up these historic buildings in downtown. The problem is they don't pencil on a pro forma. We have to put money into them. So when you look at the trio, Laura Street trio, Southeast Development already has that. There's already, the Barnett has already been done. But the reality is the cost of this historic rehab is not, can't be borne by the developers alone. Otherwise, no one will do it. There has to be some city subsidy in there mainly to support the preservation of historic. That's why historic tax credits exist. That's why historic subsidy is needed. So this program, super complicated. It's actually four programs in one. I will give Steve Kelly at the DIA a shout out. He used to work at DIA, TIA Bank, Everbank before. He helped create this program. Super confusing for the layman, but really, really works well. The city wants to limit its risk, but also invest in these projects and they're gonna do that. All right, COVID. So, uh, most people are aware we have a giant uh, global pandemic. There's a virus sweeping the world. And we've been in the middle of it for a while. Downtown Jacksonville got hit very hard. I think it got a hit harder than everywhere else in Jacksonville. I think St. Augustine Historic Downtown has been hit really hard. That's kind of the next closest downtown, maybe. Um, I, I don't know so much about Fernandina and Amelia Island, a little more spread out, but we got hit very, very hard for our region, so much so that the hotels, 60% change in hotel occupancy. I can't tell you how much of a catastrophic drop in occupancy that is. Usually when we look at these numbers, we're saying, okay, it's 2% down. How do we fix it and work with the tourism? And, you know, if we get to a higher occupancy, like 78 is good, but we'd rather be at like 85%. And then we would really be able to build more hotels because that's the occupancy rate is what you use to figure out a hotel, how viable a new hotel development is. Instead, we went the other way and we were at 17% in April, which is unbelievable. No one that I can, no one that I know in the tourism industry has ever heard of hotels being forced to close by the mayor. It didn't even close in Irma. We had all the people there. And, and so giant hurricanes, we usually use the hotels. So the fact that all the hotels had to close is unbelievably unprecedented. That word gets overused, but if you're thinking of a staycation, now would be the time and please spend your money at the Hyatt, the Omni, the Doubletree, the Lexington. All of these hotels are doing worse than they've ever done before that they could ever even imagine. The Hyatt had to let go a huge amount of people of their sales team. That is by default is our convention center. They have more leasable square feet than the Prime Osborne. And so that is where everyone stays. So Right now, we don't have as many people in downtown, and they weren't able to have any conventions. They're just now getting back to conventions happening, but this is, these effects are going to be felt for many, many, many years. So if you want to support, definitely support our hotels, support our retail. Uh, we have this, we have a new uh, way to collect statistics from Bluetooth. This takes, uh, aggregates data from your cell phone that finds out who's in downtown. You can see this first big spike that's almost 150,000 people downtown is the fireworks. So on a normal day, we have about 50, almost 60,000 people in downtown. And on a regular day, um, about 56,000 or so, you see the spikes, 150,000 of the fireworks. The second spike, I was always confused at what it is. What do you think it is? Monster Jam. Everyone loves Monster Jam in Jacksonville. So another giant spike, not quite as high as the fireworks, but close. Then you see catastrophe happened. The world dropped out. We went down to almost 60% drop, especially if you take from Monster Jam to the bottom. I mean, no one could have predicted this. 
it's been catastrophic to our businesses and retail that, that, that rely on foot traffic. If you like businesses in downtown, if you think they're around, the bars couldn't open, try to support them because don't think they're going to be around tomorrow because all of them are still struggling. There was a lot of support back in March. You see our people in Washington are not going to resupport us relatively soon, it doesn't seem like. So really all of these guys, if they got the PPV and other stuff, are running out of money and they might really be in trouble as we get towards the end of the year. So um, we comped it against the last year. You can see, you know, 2020, 8 million visits compared to almost 15 million. Really, really, really bad. I mean, half the visits, catastrophic, really, for our downtown. So um, we are, you can see we're inching back up on that. And so that is something we're working on. Um, I did want to mention our cultural institutions. Obviously, all our, all our businesses, all our, but different places are hurt different ways. You know, all of our cultural venues are here in downtown. Florida theaters canceled over 100 shows. They haven't made a dollar, really, except for the PVP and the Vistar loan with the city. They're coming back starting in December because really they have to come back. They, they're not getting any money in the door. I think there's 119 people that work there every show that aren't working right now. And uh, Numa Spacelin is the head of that. He's also our board chair, so we hear a lot about that. Mosh was one of the first to reopen because they really had to. They were really reliant on their gate coming in. And so, you know, if you love Mosh, uh, really support them right now. They are, people aren't going to cultural institutions like they used to. We do feel like it's very safe to go. They've made it a safe environment. So if you feel like it is safe, please take your kids there and, and go around. They have a bunch of new exhibits. Um, MOCA recently reopened. You can see everyone needs to wear masks now when they go out. MOCA reinvested in their virtual tours. So you don't need a person to tour you. You can use your phone. And so that is a really great thing that they double down on the technology and uh, people are using this. I mentioned Florida Theater. They replaced all their seats. They never had any space between shows to replace their seats. So they're trying to be a silver lining that without any shows, they're using all this time to replace all their seats. Their seats were made for people in like the 1800s who were a little bit less wide than me. So they had to make them a little bit wider. So, uh, but, but Mocha, if you love them, you don't have to pick everything in downtown, just pick your most favorite thing and support it. Uh, last thing, we have done an e-gift card program where if you're really scattered like me and you worry about gift cards going to only one place, you can buy a gift card for your friends that can be used at 30 different places. It's good at Mocha, it's good at Mosh, it's good at Florida Theater, and it's also good at 27 different places around downtown including the breweries, Intuition, Manifest, all these others. So, um, and we, I think we still have a promotion. We're about to roll out a different promotion. So I guess this promotion has ended, but, uh, uh, you know, go to dtjaxygiftcard.com and please support uh, this effort. And all it is is a MasterCard you can get on your phone. You just show it to them and they key it in and it's like money. And with that, that is all my yelling. Hopefully you got a little taste of how downtown Jacksonville is doing. And uh, I will stop my screen sharing so I can see the chat. And let me know what I'm supposed to do now, if uh, the chair is gonna read me questions or if anyone wants to just yell out or raise their hand or what you wanna do. Thank you. So uh, Jake, I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so you have some questions here in the chat. So DVI, DVI receives bid assessments. Where can we view the current budget for the bid and the DVI? Great. Thank you for the question, Howard Dale. I see that. Uh, former Penn Quaker like myself. Uh, former city council, I think, also. Um, the, uh, we have our annual report, which actually just had to be submitted to the DIA, so that will be on our website soon. But you can go to downtown Jacksonville. You can go to look at all our annual reports. They go all the way back to 2000. The newest one will be on there very, very soon. And you can see all of the budget and all of the assessments of what that money goes to. Very briefly, DVI spends most of its money on people. You'll see the budget, 80% goes to either our clean and safe ambassadors who are always wearing orange, walking around our district in downtown, or the seven people that myself and six more people that work in my office. So most of the money we collect, about 1.5 million goes to people. Thank so Next question is from Mike Biagini. What is the impact of Bystar and other com companies making a commitment to the downtown? Thank you for the question, Mike, and thank you for always supporting downtown. Um, Bystar, I had to mention them. Hopefully I mentioned them enough. It can't be understated their impact on downtown. 
I will say before them, Everbank made a huge commitment in downtown and so did Citizens Insurance. So what we need in downtown is more people being here every day, more residents and more people that work here. So Bystar is a local uh, credit union started at NES Jacks. They were on the west side. I met with some of their board members when they were thinking about moving and they were very, very, they had a lot of questions, like maybe many of you do about downtown. And even though we're in the same city, I think Brian Wolfberg as our new CEO deserves a lot of credit with being like, no, we need to be forward facing as an organization. We need to be in downtown. One of the things that really helps is they have a skyline presence on their building now. They bought a building for $50 million and they put their name in the skyline, which is something that downtown has and not a lot of other places have. And I will say from a, from a perspective of Jacksonville, our identity in Jacksonville is very confusing. I see car dealerships all the time use the skyline in their commercials and they're nowhere near downtown. There's just nowhere else to say, hey, I'm in Jacksonville. In fact, Forbes uses our little, our little logo is our little skyline because no one has any other way to identify Jacksonville. It's very interesting to think what is iconic to Jacksonville. So anyway, Vistar, unbelievably important. I think they were gonna move 700 people and now I think it's closer to 1200. Um, we need more businesses in downtown and more businesses in the city to think about that and to move their people downtown. I will say not to, uh, CSX is another business that's in downtown, it's fantastic, but CSX is a fence around their whole property. They're almost like a little campus, but they're not integrated where if you look at what Vistar's doing, they're doing it like when you walk to Manhattan, there's no fences in Manhattan in a downtown. There's like an alleyway that's gonna be open to the public in between their parking garage and Vistar's tower where they're gonna have like a coffee shop and a bunch of tables and people are gonna be able to walk through. And then you go, well, won't homeless people walk through there? And it's like, yeah, that happens in every downtown. And so we've got to add money to fix that, which my organization has helped doing. But if you really want to be, if you want to be like Atlanta or like Chicago or Seattle, the way to do it is not build fences and like fence yourself off. It's to, I'm going to be very excited the day that CSX goes, wow, maybe I should take down this fence around my parking lot. And then my people could walk in and out without being behind a fence. It's really just a perception not a reality, it's about what you're ready to deal with. So anyway, long answer to the question, but hopefully that answered it. So this is from Sid Jones, and this is a good question. Will not needing a car to get around preclude affordable parking? So are you gonna solve the parking problem? That's great, so again, I don't want to be clear. I'm not telling CSX to take down their fence. I just want them to decide to take down their fence. So it's the same thing with you guys. I want you to decide to come downtown without a car. One of the reasons you do that in other cities is because it's so busy. I mean, you don't do that in Manhattan. People take a bus, then they get in, a, then they get on like a ferry, and then they get to downtown because there is parking in Manhattan, but it's like 80 bucks a space or 180 bucks a space or something at this point. I think what we have to do, and the DIA is doing this, is a better parking strategy for downtown. The parking meters are way too cheap. They're 50 cents. We don't, we want those spaces to be there for people to come in, go to UPS store, go to other places, right? now people use them all the time and don't so it shouldn't preclude affordable parking i guess the question of what does affordable mean if there if, if you get on the skyway i have two staff members that ride the skyway every day if you use it jta does a good job and you get here you just have it's a mindset you're not gonna be able to get there right away you have to wait seven minutes or something so we're not gonna stop people from building parking but ultimately we don't want to build a bunch more parking garages in downtown the strategy there is to build way less of those and to have people be able to get in, like go tuck in, where you can call them on your app and they'll take you anywhere you wanna go from right here all the way over to Brooklyn and all these other areas. So this is a comment slash question from Pete Denham. I have heard from Mayor Curry that having 10,000 residents downtown is a magic number that gets us to be more self-sustaining as a downtown. You know that we are just above 6,000 population downtown. Do you describe to the $10,000 number as a goal and how long will it take it to get us to 10,000? Great question. So I think both those things are true. The difference between 10 is a magic number that is used by a lot of downtowns that once you're there, it starts rolling the ball downhill. So at 6,000, we are still rolling the ball uphill. Village Bread that's on the South Bank that's open all the time relies on residents to go there, but there's not that many residents. So they don't do as well as we'd want them to do. Once you get to 10,000 residents, it definitely becomes easier, excuse me, to get retail. At the same time, if you're downtown Atlanta, which I've mentioned many times, 
they have like 30,000 residents and they still think they don't have enough. It's like an endless goal. It's just all about where you're at. I do think that 10,000 is a great goal over the next couple of years because there is something to be said. Now, our downtown, you know, it's like you use these strategies from other cities and you bring them to our city. We're pretty spread out even for a downtown. So like we probably could use 10,000 people just in Brooklyn. And then that, that, you know, the grocery store there and the retail there, you saw like when Unity Plaza opened that retail, even with all those people living above it, it still wasn't able to carry a lot of that retail. So you always need way more people than you think uh, to really make the retail experience and to have a lot of people walking. I mean, the people we have walking on the street are only like, you know, a couple percentage points of who's actually in downtown at any given time. So hopefully that was a question. So this is a comment from Liz McCoy, and she wants to say, I wanted to commend to you and your team on the Hocus Pocus movie night last week. It was a huge event, but I felt very COVID safe, a beautiful way to experience Halloween in our city's downtown. Thanks, Liz. Obviously, friends of James Wilden Johnson Park, formerly Hamming Park, they're a great partner of ours. We didn't mention all the other things we do with the money, but one of the things we do is events. We do First Wednesday Art Walk that hasn't been happening. So we did a COVID safe family movie on the landing lawn that was incredibly successful. And Liz got to go to an event that she didn't have to work, which was good. And uh, we, we were there, but it was, uh, Tracy was also there and uh, she was right up front as a VIP. So we had a really good event and we're probably gonna do another one around the holidays. So go to dzjacks.com and sign up for a newsletter. I had a lot of people on the internet yelling at me they didn't hear about it. So sign up for a newsletter and you'll be the first to know. Uh, DDI State of Downtown Report 2019 to 2020 states that the homelessness is one of downtown's biggest negatives. In your opinion, what needs to be done and how can we at the Rotary Club of Jacksonville help? I love that. And Tracy and I, as a former chair, we've talked about Rotary as this powerful tool. You know, one of the things that DBI and downtown has not done well is like, there's a lot of people passionate about downtown, but we don't do a good job of like focusing that into like other things. And I remember I went to downtown Savannah and there's a huge playground there and it has a huge sign that said Rotary built this playground. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. How do we do that? I know you guys do a lot of amazing stuff. Um, so homelessness is absolutely, this is an issue that is not unique to Jacksonville. It's happening everywhere. Homelessness and transient, because a lot of these people have homes. They just go home, you know, the people hanging out in Hemming and or now James Bond and Johnson, uh, uh, Main Street Park that's on Main Street in downtown just reopened. If you if you saw that, there was just tons of people hanging out there for no good reason. It wasn't like anyone was using the park for the right reasons. And so we helped the city get planters, much like James Weldon Johnson Park has. So I have to punt on the question of how Rotary Club can help, but I would be love to talk to you as chair or others as we get other things going. We are going to have more downtown cleanups for the Riverwalk. We just did the first one. We're probably going to do one of those every other month. So that would be a great way for you guys to help opt in to the cleanup, which we uh, really should be doing a better job of that. But there should be a lot more ways to help. And I do think um, social services, I've been making myself an expert on it. And the reality was the mayor has done a great job. He's had a task force for downtown homelessness for, for years now. But really, we had no real plan for downtown homelessness before that. I mean, the sheriff's office doesn't believe it's their job to deal with this, which arguably it isn't. So the police don't do anything related to people sleeping on the street. Uh, and then the, the, the shelters are there, but they don't have any go between between the shelters and the streets. So my organization three years ago added one person whose job it is to walk around, ask these people on the street if they want to go to the shelters. It was just the barely first start. But if you go to other cities, like we went to Cleveland, they have a huge robust plan for how to get people out of their downtown and into the shelters, especially if you have Jacobs Field and all these giant venues that have people sleeping out front, there needs to be a better plan for that. So uh, I commend the mayor on that. But again, this is a long-term problem. I don't think the social services were even talking to each other. I know I knew nothing about it. We're in a much better place now, but we've got to do a lot more in that regard. So this is a kind of an advertisement, but it's Steph Dale. And she says, do you have a list of the various office spaces coming back to downtown area and their dates? Uh, right now, we, meaning her business, is looking at many looking to return in January 2021. Also, they can use the DT gift card for our Go Tuck In tours. Yes, they can. Thank you, Steph. 
and uh, Steph sends me emails and I try to get back to all of them. It's been very, very much like you have Lori Boyer. You're going to see she's going to be like drinking from the fire hose where five years ago, I had way less to do than now because so many things are happening, which is incredible. I will say you mentioned people coming back. We're in this weird area right now where a bunch of offices are back and it's really just about the mindset of the CEO or whoever's making the decisions. And then now not a lot of, we had a bunch of people come back right away. My office is open, for example. And then we're hearing a lot of other people are coming back January, 2020. I, I would agree with that, that people, in like a month or so ago said, nothing's gonna change before the end of the year. And so Vistar I think is still temporary and all of them, I'm, my understanding is they're coming all back in January, even if, especially if nothing changes the way it is right now. So we are in this really weird area. You see that we, for every 10 people on the street in downtown, we have four, right, we had four at the beginning of COVID and now we have about 5.5. So we don't think, anywhere near enough people are coming back until we get to January when we're hopefully get closer to nine. So this is a, a comment about Seattle. This is from Jim Agee. Not like Seattle. I'm an airline pilot. I stopped bidding layovers in the city 10 years ago. We need a safe, clean downtown. So totally agree. It's about keeping our downtown really cool. I mean, I would love like a Pike's Place Market or some other cool stuff like that. Everyone wants stuff like that. At the same time, downtown Seattle also has Amazon on. They also have Starbucks nearby. They have Microsoft. They have these giant like entities, but it, they really have a horrendous transient problem that's like out of control. And if you saw, uh, I, they also have so much retail that was relying on foot traffic. And so now they're a ghost town too. So everything is closing. I just talked to John who does my job in downtown Seattle. And he was like morose, despondent, like to the nth degree of like, oh my God, my job went from like being kind of fun to being almost impossible where every day everything's closing. So ironically, our downtown being a little less evolved really insulated us from some of these issues. The other thing is we can plan on not making the transient issues as bad. I will say Florida and the rules and Jacksonville's rules are way better set up to deal with some of this population. Uh, the laws of, of Washington and Seattle, you know, you can't move anyone. If you go to downtown LA, you're not allowed to move a tent that's set up in the middle of downtown because that's someone's home. And I'm very open hearted, but it's really hard to run a good downtown when you have people that can just pitch a tent right in the middle of downtown LA. And they've moved them a little bit, but there's like this ring of tents around LA. So when I mentioned that every city is having a horrible, I'm on the International Downtown Association, I mentioned that. Number one thing is homelessness. They just did a report, they're gonna do another report. For whatever reason, this stuff, the inequity and in economy is really showing itself in these public spaces in our cities. So. We want to take the good things from Seattle and then not do any of the bad things. So this is going to be the last question, but there's others. And, and this is from Howard Dale. What is the status of the unfinished high rise at the ship guards across from the police spot building on Bay Street? So if you read the daily record, there's a lot of news on that. My understanding is they just pulled permits to knock it down. I will say that this mayor, uh, Lenny Curry has been very supportive of downtown and has basically run on a platform in downtown. A lot of uh, politics this year and kind of the last years, a lot of uh, division. I love everyone coming together. It seems like there's division. Downtown's for everyone, in my opinion. But from us, we haven't gotten any, we've just gotten so much support from the city of Jacksonville and the mayor and city council about downtown. Mayor Curry said right from the beginning of his term, what is going on with this? Why is there this weird skeleton building in downtown? You see though, it's not that easy. The way that got like that was one way, and if you're another city, maybe you'd throw money at it, but you don't even have enough money to throw at it. If that was in New Jersey, it would never be like that because the rents you could get from to fix it up would pay for the fixing it up. But that's a problem. The only other building I've ever seen like that in my life is on I-4, the I-4 eyesore that people know. And you never would have that in the Northeast because people way, pay way more to live there. It's not like the city did something different. New Jersey is super messed up and they, don't get, they can't get out of their own way. It's that people want to live there and will pay way more to live in a building like that. So it's going to outpace construction costs. And so I really hope something happens with that. It's been like that for like eight, nine, 10 years now. Um, right. We've heard there is stuff going on. And I mean, the last one is just about JSO. Mike yeah. Williams and JSO, again, like Mayor Curry, Sheriff Williams has done an amazing job of supporting downtown, but there's a lot of things to fix. And even the zone for downtown has been the zone for years. Downtown zone goes from the river to Trout River. 
it makes no sense. So like when you call for service in downtown, someone's like, yeah, my guys are up at Trout River. It's like, is that the same city? It's unbelievable that you would not have the zone be downtown. Um, and then actually all of the South Bank is a different zone, zone, zone two. So, you know, I had to learn all that. There's 17 zones. I will say that downtown Jacksonville is the fourth safest zone, even with all of the zone, even with Florida, Georgia and all the events we have. So people think that there's a lot of crime in downtown. There is not. It's the fourth safest zone in the whole city by violent crime. And that includes like whole swaths of area that have no people in them. So anyway, just want to answer that last one too. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jake. Thank you so much for coming in. Appreciate Thank it. Thanks. Remember, we will not meet next Monday during our hybrid meeting on November 16th. We have a great program planned with Lieutenant General Steve Quast, who will bring us a program about the water and space the Belt and Road, and why the Chinese threat is real, and we need to be ready. At the conclusion of this meeting, our Zoom platform will remain open. Uh, there's going to be a membership, there's going to be a meeting of the Project and Screening Committee for those of you who are attending that. The uh, MOP meeting for Marie Nagy's has been canceled, and uh, there will be an option on the screen if you want to join the Project and Screening Committee. Be sure to look at, click on the breakout button at the bottom or side of your screen if you're expected to be in that meeting. If you do not see that as an option, uh, send Sherry a note in chat saying you want to be in it. This will allow you to meet into that meeting. For the rest of you, uh, thank you again, Jake. It was a wonderful meeting. Uh, we hope you have a good week. This concludes our club meeting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.